Welcome once again. This is a very, very special video. If you think that there is any chance that perhaps you might run across an atheist or a fake Christian sometime in the future, this video is for you. You have to realize that fake Christians and atheists have something in common. Actually, fake Christians, I would say, is worse than atheists because they bear the name of the Lord and as the name implies, they're fake. But they both have something in common. They both have powerless gods or a powerless God. Let me explain. Atheists have gods, whether they believe it or not, whether they know it or not, they have gods. It might be money, it might be career, it might be pseudoscience, and one of the most popular gods of atheists is self. Fake Christians have a god too, but the god that they have is not real in their life. So therefore, it is powerless. It is a form of religion. It is a form of godliness, as the scripture says, but denying the power thereof. It doesn't have power. So how do you effectively deal with atheists and fake Christians? We find the answer in scripture. For those of you who are familiar with the Bible, think of a time, think of an event where there was like a showdown, like a confrontation, a confrontation between the real God and fake gods, a confrontation between people who think they have power and the one who really does have power. If you thought of Elijah and his confrontation on Mount Carmel, you are correct. One of the most powerful portions of scripture where Elijah proves that his God is God. Now you might ask, well, what, what does that have to do with us confronting atheists today or us confronting fake Christians today? It has a lot to do with it. We can learn lessons that will cause us to be victorious in any such confrontation. Now I am going to give you the key that is found in this portion of scripture that will give you the power, the same evidence that Elijah had. But we must understand the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel to get this key. Let's go to the scripture and read it. I'm gonna start right at verse one. This is 1 Kings chapter 18 because this will give us the full context of the story. After many days, Yahweh's word came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab. Remember, Ahab was the king here. And I will send rain on the earth. Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. The famine was severe in Samaria. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared Yahweh greatly. For when Jezebel cut off Yahweh's prophets, Obadiah took 100 prophets and hid them 50 to a cave and fed them with bread and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive that we not lose all the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. As Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. He recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord, Elijah? He answered him, It is I. Go, tell your lord. Behold, Elijah is here. He said, How have I sinned that you would deliver your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As Yahuwah your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. When they said he is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they didn't find you. Now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. It will happen as soon as I leave you that Yahweh's spirit will carry you. I don't know where. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he can't find you, he will kill me. But I, your servant, have feared Yahweh from my youth. Wasn't it told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed Yahweh's prophets? How I hid 100 men of Yahweh's prophets with 50 to a cave and fed them with bread and water? 
Now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Elijah said, as Yahweh of armies lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. The stage is set here, and Elijah knew it. Ahab was seeking him like he never sought anybody before, and here he was. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now notice how Elijah answered the king. Okay, think about this. This is the king he's talking to. He answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house in that you have forsaken Yahweh's commandments and you have followed the Baals. The word Baal here, or in Hebrew, Baal, means Lord. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel to Mount Carmel and 450 of the prophets of Baal and 400 of the prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. What a request that was. Elijah told the king to call the whole nation and all of the spiritual leaders, the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the Asherah. So Ahab sent to all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together to Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you waver between two sides? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. This is the problem in fake Christianity today, in a lot of fake Christians today. They are wavering between the real deal and, well, just churchianity, just the social group, the religious social group that they attend every Sunday. Well, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God, and I believe in the Bible, but it doesn't go much further than that. They have the Baal, they have the Lord, but they don't have the real God of the Bible. The people didn't say a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left as a prophet of Yahweh. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Elijah is setting the stage perfectly here. Now he says, look it, I want you to notice something. There's 450 of them and only one of me. Verse 23, let them therefore give us two bowls. Let them choose one bowl for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under and I will dress the other bowl and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. You call on the name of your God, and I will call on Yahweh's name. The God who answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and dress it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. They took the bull which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, and nobody answered. They leaped about the altar which was made. At noon, Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is deep in thought, or he has gone somewhere, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he sleeps and must be awakened. Wake him up, he must be sleeping. They cried aloud and cut themselves in their way with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. When midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the evening offering. But there was no voice, no answer, and nobody paid attention. Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. He repaired Yahweh's altar that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom Yahweh's word came, saying, Israel shall be your name. With the stones he built an altar in Yahweh's name. He made a trench around the altar large enough to contain two seahs of seed. It says here, one seah is about seven liters or 1.9 gallons. So he made a trench around the altar to contain about 14 liters of seed. He put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. He said, fill four jars with water 
and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. He said, do it a second time. And they did it the second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it the third time. The water ran around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the evening offering, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that you, Yahweh, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Important little notes here. Notice that Elijah used the name Israel instead of Jacob. Israel is Jacob's born again name. He used Abraham, of course, instead of Abram, which again is Abraham's born again name. And he also talked about turning their heart back again, which is talking about true repentance. Verse 38, then Yahuwah's fire fell and consumed the burnt offering the wood, the stones, and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Don't you wish you had the power of Elijah to confront atheists and fake Christians and show them the real, real deal, the real God? That power, that evidence is available today. Now, in order to use this evidence, in order to present this evidence to atheists and to fake Christians, you have to understand the story of Elijah. The sacrifice is symbolic of sin. The whole idea of sacrifice, the whole idea of sin sacrifice is exactly that, to sacrifice sin. Note, there are a lot of times throughout Scripture where God says, I don't want your sacrifices. Your sacrifices are a stench to me. I don't want that. I want you to repent. See, the problem is when people offered their sacrifice back in those days, they didn't connect it with their sin. They didn't, they didn't identify it with sin, and therefore they did not truly repent. And that's when God said, listen, I don't want your sacrifices. If you're sacrificing animals and there is no repentance, then it's just useless. So the whole idea of animal sacrifices in scripture is putting sin to death. And the whole story of the confrontation that Elijah had on Mount Carmel was which God, which God is it? Your God, atheist, the God of self, the God of money, the God of power, the God of material things, materialism, humanism, which God has the power to consume sin, to consume a life of sin, to consume drug addiction, alcoholism, addiction to cigarettes, nicotine, which God has the power to consume these things at once? This is where it's at. Who has the power to completely change a life, to completely recreate a life? I once had an atheist tell me, well, you weren't there during creation, so how do you know? But little Mr. Atheist, you weren't around when I was recreated. You weren't around when I was reborn. You weren't around when I became a new creation in Christ. When that sacrifice was completely devoured. And even the water was completely devoured. You weren't around for that, were you? Where were you? Where were you when my life was completely changed by the power of God, by the fire of God? Where were you? An atheist once told me, well, you see, I quit heroin addiction all by myself. Brute force. I quit heroin addiction. So therefore, you know, I've got that power. Uh, excuse me. You can't just come with one tire and say you got a car. Okay. I mean, yeah. Okay. So maybe you quit heroin. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you quit heroin. What about the bitterness you have in your heart? Are you completely recreated? 
is sin gone in your life? Are you a new creation? There are lots and lots of Christians out there that can testify. I once was full of bitterness and unforgiveness and had lots of addictions and lots of sin in my life and God broke it all by the power of God. By the fire of God, he came and burned it all up. And then I became born again, a new creation in Christ. Yeah, you might be able to quit heroin on your own without the power of God. You might be able to quit smoking on your own without the power of God. But can you say that the power of sin has been broken over your life? That you are a new creation? That you are a new person? That you don't have any unforgiveness, any bitterness in your heart anymore? That you are quick to forgive, quick to just heap mercy on people that do you wrong? Do you have that power? Does your God, atheists, your God, I'm talking about yourself, your own willpower, does your God have the power to break every chain in your life and change your heart and make you a new person? When I got born again, one of my neighbors, I mean, this was a neighbor that was not a church-going neighbor. I wouldn't even consider this neighbor to be a believing neighbor at all. I would think that perhaps this neighbor might have been an atheist. But this neighbor stopped me and said, what happened to you? You are a totally different person. Like night and day, they said, that is their word. That is what they said to me. That the, the difference in my life was like the difference between night and day. Atheists, fake Christians, do you have the power? Do you have the power in your little mind or in your little church? Do you have the power to change a person's life completely? where they used to be selfish, they used to be full of bitterness, they used to be full of sinful addictions, and all of a sudden, it all changed. Do you have that power? I challenge you, call on your little fake powerless God, and I guarantee you, you can be calling from morning till evening, and your little mind power, will power, your little fake church power, your little fake God that you have, won't answer, will not give you the answer that I'm looking for. You cannot recreate this without the power of God. Atheists, fake Christians, you cannot reproduce the same results as someone who has truly been born again, someone who has truly died to self, died to sin, and became a new creation in Christ. You cannot reproduce that. That is a power that can only be found in the one true God. Oh, atheists, you can deny it. You can stick your head in the sand and say that there is no proof and no evidence. You can stick your fingers in your ear like a little child and not hear it. You can put a blindfold over your eyes and you can completely deny it, but it's there. And if you're honest with yourself, you have to admit there's a power that you don't know about. And fake Christian, shame on you for wearing the name of God without showing this power to the world. Pastors, priests, bishops, church leaders of every area of church life and ministry, it's about time you start preaching the cross again. The power of the fire of God to consume the burnt offering, to consume the sin, and the power of the Spirit of God to raise you from the dead. The true born again experience. I'm not talking about just going forward at a church and saying a prayer, oh Lord, I, you know, I am sorry. You know, I believe in you. I believe that there is a God and there, Jesus died on the cross. Hey, the devil believes too. The devil knows that Jesus died on the cross, that Jesus came, that Jesus rose from the dead. So what? Show it. One thing the devil cannot do is not is repent. A true born again experience is exactly what I've been talking about all along. It's the experience 
of the fire of God consuming the burnt offering on Mount Carmel. It's the experience of saying, I was a dirty, filthy, rotten, stinking sinner, but now I'm a completely, totally different person. My heart is completely changed. I used to have a stony heart, but now I have a soft heart. Now my heart is sensitive to the Lord, sensitive to sin, sensitive to others. I used to have a heart that was stony and cold, but now I have a heart of flesh, a heart of warmth, a heart that is willing, willing, in fact, happy to forgive those that have wronged you. That is true love. That is true selfless love. It's not about pleasure. No pleasure at all in the scene. It's not about pleasure. It's about sacrificing yourself, sacrificing everything you have, including your own reputation. So the next time you run across an atheist or fake Christian, challenge them. Where's the power? Where's the power? If what you say is true, if you really know better, then you should be more powerful, right? You should have the power, be it in your own self, be it in your church, be it in your doctrine. Where is the power? Where is the power to completely consume the burnt offering, the offering of sin in every area of your life? Where is the power to completely change your life and make you a brand new creation? Now, if what I've said has blessed you, make sure you share it with somebody. Ask the Lord whom you should share it with.